Hey everybody, I'm The Gaming Rift, and today we're going to be ranking the boss fights of Dark Souls 1 from worst to best. I hope that you enjoy this new series, as the Dark Souls games have always been a favourite of mine, and I would love to share that with you guys in the future. With that being said, I won't take up any more of your time. Feel free to subscribe if you want more videos like this, and comment more ranking videos topics down below. Out of all the boss fights in Dark Souls 1, this is the one that I have the least to talk about. He's just a reskin of the Stray Demon set of flame. Sure, it makes narrative sense him being there, but he literally has the exact same moveset, and I'm pretty sure he does similar amounts of damage. The only thing worth talking about is the arena, it's pretty massive at first, but those branches really can get in your way when trying to dodge this fucker's attacks. There's really not much to say. This represents the absolute worst of Dark Souls, because not only is it a reskin, but it literally doesn't need to exist. The Lost Isolith already has four boss fights. We really didn't need a reskin of a previous fight in this pretty bad area. The Moonlight Butterfly is easily the most boring fight in the entire game. The reason for this is because if you're a spellcaster, you can kill the thing in about 10 seconds and carry on with your day as if nothing happened. But if you're a melee build or you have no ranged capabilities at all for whatever reason, you are at the mercy of this thing's many, many spells before it eventually comes into rest. And if you can't have the damage to kill it in one cycle, well the entire thing begins all over again. Those spells actually hit pretty hard also, and the very restrictive level design for the arena doesn't help much either. It's such a shame too, it could have been so cool, but it ended up being one of the most boring fights for me. The fight against the Capra Demon boils down to one thing, can you survive the first 10 seconds? Yes? Well then the fight is essentially over, you have more than enough time to kill his two canine pets, and the boss himself, whilst yeah he hits pretty hard, the arena is serviceable enough for dealing with a one on one fight, and the Capra Demon doesn't even have that much health, meaning that if you know what you're doing, this is the most predictable fight in the entire game, and by far the one that I have the least to talk about as far as the early game bosses go. I know that you guys are going to be surprised to see the Bed of Chaos is not the worst boss in the game, however I have a few things to say about this fight. For one, your progress is saved when you go back into this fight, every time you destroy one of her arms, I guess? Meaning that you don't actually have to repeat it if you die, which is a very big saving grace to this fight. And also, I do really like the idea, the music is great, the design is pretty great, everything about this fight is good, except the fight itself. The whole idea of having a platforming boss in a Souls game is not a good idea, and this was such a huge missed potential. I like the idea, and at the very least, you do have checkpoints within the fight, but that's as much as I can say about this one. Take everything I said about the Moonlight Butterfly and apply it here. Although to give credit where credit's due, Gwendolyn's arena is a lot more entertaining, and his spells are, require far more engagement from the player to dodge successfully, making good use of the level design. But again, that's all I can really say. Other than that, it's really bullshit how he will teleport away and you have to begin the cycle all over again, meaning that if you don't have the sufficient damage to take him out consistently, this will be a very long, boring boss fight. Oh, Pinwheel, we meet again. This fight is really cool, and I like the lore, and the fact that you have to juggle multiple opponents is nice on paper, but he just dies so incredibly quickly that whatever would happen is completely irrelevant. Fighting him when you've just come out of the asylum at the start of the game, for example, is actually a nice challenge, because Pinwheel, despite having extremely low health, does hit pretty hard, so if you want to go for the right of kindling early on, it's a pretty good challenge, but let's be honest, we all take them on after getting the Lord's Vessel, so he's basically a joke at that point. The Centipede Demon is a fight of two halves. The first half is he stays out of your range and just takes pot shots at you, similar to the Moonlight Butterfly. However, when he finally approaches your platform and begins an actual up-close fight, it doesn't get much better. The reason for this is because you're basically fighting the camera for the entire fight, and you don't really have much to see other than his ankles. He has a couple of unique attacks, such as the AoE, and hell, if you play your cards right, you can literally make him clip out of bounds and die via gravity. So, there's that, I guess. 
Other than that, though, it's just another boring demon on the way to the most forgettable of the Lord Souls. The Ceaseless Discharge is my favourite of the Isolith boss gauntlet, but I still don't think he's spectacular. He has really good design and pretty interesting lore, and a giant arena to fight him in, which I do appreciate. It's also pretty cool that you can fight this guy in two ways, either cheesing him by making him fall off, or fighting him the intended way. The Discharge hits incredibly fucking hard, but he's very slow and you have more than enough time to heal in between his assault. Other than that though, you just wait for him to attack and just punish him. There's not too much to say other than that, aside from you have to kill him to lower the lava level to access the rest of the demon ruins. He's an okay fight, but nothing special. The best way I can describe the Taurus demon is he's just the Asylum demon but worse. Uh, not impressive arena, it's pretty restrictive in terms of design. You do have the opportunity to plunge attack him, but again the Asylum Demon did that first. And in terms of his design and movement, he's okay, you do need to be careful to not get knocked off the edge. But he's a pretty easy fight and not at all remarkable, especially since we have already fought a demon similar to him. The Stray Demon has exactly the same moveset as the Demon Fire Sage, as previously mentioned, so why is he so much higher on the list? Well for one, I like that the fight is teased from the start of the game, as you can see him immediately from leaving your prison cell. The way you enter the fight is also pretty cool, as you drop in from the roof and bam, you're in a giant arena with a huge foe. Other than that though, there's not much to say. He's essentially just a roided up asylum demon with a couple extra bells and whistles. Not much to say other than that, he's an okay fight and I enjoy doing it. The first time I saw the gaping dragon, I was actually pretty impressed. Up until this point, we've been taking on humanoid-ish opponents with the demons and what have you, so to be put into a fight with this fucking creature is actually pretty cool. It's just a shame that his moveset doesn't leave much to the imagination. Aside from the charge, his attacks don't hit that hard, although you do need to watch out for that attack, as it will leave you good as dead with how hard it hits. It's pretty cool that you can cut off his tail as well, being one of the first bosses in the game aside from the gargoyles where that's actually possible. This is a pretty decent fight, it's incredibly easy, but it's good. The tutorial boss of Dark Souls 1 leaves little to be desired when it comes to difficulty, but it's surprisingly good quality. There's multiple ways you can take this guy on. You can either go through the level and get all of your class's equipment and then fight him the proper way after taking a plunge attack, or hell, you can pick the black firebombs as your starting gear and take him on like that to get the demon's great hammer. The arena is also pretty good with pillars that you can use for crowd control and you have pretty decent spacing. In terms of his moveset, well, if you fought the Stray Demon before, you pretty much know how this guy's moveset works. He's pretty basic, very slow, he does hit pretty hard, and he's a menacing sight. But he is incredibly easy, and pretty much everyone can kill this guy in about 30 seconds on every run. So, in the middle of the road. The only thing standing between you and Anno Londo is this menacing looking golem. This is probably the most Dark Souls 2-ish boss in Dark Souls 1. He fights very similarly to the last giant, or that's how he reminds me of anyways. He has a couple of slash attacks with his axe, but an interesting gimmick with him is whilst yes, he can grab you and throw you off the edge if you're not careful, you can also do the same to him. If you attack his ankles enough times, he will start wobbling around like a drunk. If you keep doing it and persist with your attacks, he will eventually fall over, and depending on his positioning, you can get him to fall off the arena for an easy win, which I think's quite funny to be honest. Priscilla is probably the most unique boss in the entire game. For one, she gives you the option to not fight her at all. You can ignore her and take the pacifist's approach and return straight to Anno Londo, although if you decide to take her on, she's a pretty cool fight. For one, she's completely invisible at the start and you have to track her movements in the snow, which is pretty cool design-wise. From there, however, she's not overly complicated. She fights very similarly to basic mobs, having swipe attacks with her scythe. She is pretty cool and you can cut her tail off, which is, again, pretty nice design-wise. But she's nothing too special and she's above average in as far as Dark Souls 1 bosses go. Sif is one of the more tragic boss fights in Dark Souls, especially when you read the lore, and it's quite fascinating that depending on if you've done the DLC prior to this fight or not, you actually get a different cutscene where Sif remembers you from when you took up arms together against Manus, but he unfortunately still has to fight you to defend his master's honour. So how's the fight itself? Well it kinda reminds me as to what the beast battles in Bloodborne would eventually turn into. 
Sif is pretty primitive compared to those. He does a lot of damage and is deceptively fast for a wolf of his stature. However, he is still easy to punish if you can get the timing right. He's a pretty cool fight and one of the more tragic characters in the game. Gravelord Nito is probably one of the best bosses in the game design-wise. The Cloak of Darkness flowing off of a body made of deceased skeletons is actually really fucking cool, especially since his blade is also made of bones. And the fight itself is actually pretty good. The arena is massive and you have clear space to work with when dealing with Nito and the many skeletons. Especially if you bring a holy weapon to this fight which can trivialize the skeletons completely. Especially since Nito himself can also damage the many, many, many enemies in the arena as well. Which makes it much easier to deal with. You can get toxic if you're not careful, although it's really not that big of an issue as Nito does die relatively quickly, especially at this point in the game. Overall, it's a pretty good fight that I think is slightly underrated. As far as early game bosses go, I think the gargoyles strike the perfect balance of aggression, yet fair difficulty. They don't have that much health between them, but I think what makes this work is that the first gargoyle you have to take him to half health before the second gargoyle appears but that one enters the fight already with low health, which I think helps make the design really well, as you are taught how to fight one gargoyle in a one-on-one -on -one before then having to rapidly adapt to taking on two at once. The fire attacks are pretty cool as well, especially when they both do it synchronized, and you can also cut off the gargoyle's tail to get the great axe. Overall, it's a pretty good fight and easily the most memorable in the early game. Seath might not have the best designed fight when looking at it in a vacuum. However, everything about this encounter is just pure gorgeous. Once you take out the crystal that is the source of his power, you know, keeps him from being damaged, and you actually go in for the kill, he's pretty challenging. His many legs can thrash around hitting you, and you can also be at the mercy of his crystals, which do a pretty decent amount of damage. If you're not paying attention, he can also curse you, which admittedly is a pretty shit mechanic. But if you play your cards right and you cut off his middle tail, you can get the Moonlight Greatsword, which is a fantastic fan service weapon, as it's a fan favourite. Overall, this is a pretty good fight against a gorgeous looking foe. It's just a shame that if you die to the boss, you have a pretty long run through the Crystal Caves to get back to him. I think Quaylag is one of the best designed bosses in the entire game. Not just in terms of visuals, wink wink, but also in terms of the fight itself. It's pretty cool how you have to deal with her and the spider at the same time. The spider can vomit pools of lava on the ground which makes positioning very difficult, especially since the spider takes reduced damage compared to Quaylag's humanoid body. However, attacking her presents its own challenges as you're at the mercy of her fire-based sword attacks. She also has an AoE which will likely catch you off guard the first time you do this fight due to how much damage it does and the small wind up. Overall this is a fantastic fight in terms of visuals and difficulty and pretty much everything. It's just a shame that the other fiery bosses later in the game didn't match her quality. I don't think there's a boss fight in the entirety of Dark Souls 1 that gives me as much of a rush as the Four Kings do. This is easily the best of the Lord Souls because of how frantic it feels and how much it challenges you. You have around 60 seconds to kill a king before a second one spawns in, meaning that if your damage is not high enough, this will escalate into one of the most difficult fights in the entire game. Each king is also pretty fun to fight, having a mixture of you know, melee based attacks with pretty deceptive range, in addition to magic based AoEs. What's pretty cool though is that when you kill a king, you can keep hitting his corpse to, you know, take down more of the boss's health bar, so that the second and third and subsequent kings are far easier to deal with. Overall, this is one of the most memorable encounters in the entire game. The arena, granted it's not visually beautiful, but it's just so haunting taking on these massive opponents in the void. It's such a memorable encounter and one that I remember fondly. Your experience with Gwyn will vary greatly based on one thing. Can you parry his attacks? If you can, well, the fight is essentially over before it even begins, depending on your damage. All it takes is two very good parry and reposts, and you've killed the final boss in two hits. However, if you can't parry him, well, holy shit, good luck. Gwyn is incredibly aggressive and very fast hitting, 
with his attacks doing a shit ton of damage, which makes him a very fun fight. But also the music and the atmosphere and everything about this truly screams perfection. As far as final bosses go, I don't think it's aged all that well and it's one of the weaker final bosses in the series, but holy shit, I just have a lot of nostalgia for this and I'm sure that I'm not the only one who feels the same. We've literally found our first DLC boss as we've cracked into the top 5. That should speak volumes as to how good the bosses were in the DLC. The Sanctuary Guardian is easily the weakest of the four, but that's not saying much given how good the other three are. He's an incredibly aggressive opponent and one of the best beast bosses. It's pretty cool how he has wind and lightning based attacks, I've always found that really cool, and he also has poison which you have to watch out for as well. Overall, this guy controls the battle throughout the entire fight and you need to match his aggression in order to come out alive. But he never feels bullshit and it never feels like he's overwhelming you either. I think he's the perfect challenge and one of the best ways to open the Artorius of the Abyss DLC. Ooh, might ruffle some feathers with this one. I should point out that these top four bosses are interchangeable for me as they are all freaking fantastic in their own regard. However, I think Artorius is my least favourite of the four, but not by much. This fight is incredible and one of the best humanoid fights in the entire series, and the fact that you're fighting this guy at a fraction of his overall power, yet he can still kick your ass if you're not careful, is a testament to how strong Artorius is. The fight is really good, you're fighting an aggressive, powerful knight that also has fallen victim to the abyss, as you see going into the fight, you know, he's clearly corrupted, and midway through the fight he even uses the abyss to power up, where his attack attacks become insanely strong and will are capable of one-shotting you if you get hit by an entire combo, even with high vitality. Artorius is a phenomenal challenge, he has great lore, the fight is visually beautiful, everything about this fight is great. I just prefer the other three. What can be said about Onstein and Smur that hasn't already been said? Well, simply put, they are the perfect gank boss. How Onstein is small but lightning quick, and Smo is a lumbering opponent that can decimate you in seconds. This fight has an incredible atmosphere, with the music being some of the best in the entire series, with the arena being really good. Not only is it spacious, but you have the pillars that can be used for crowd control. Interestingly enough, the fight also has replayability, as you can take on Onstein or Smo first, with the second half of the fight you're taking on the stronger version of whichever one you still have to kill, with Smo becoming insanely strong and Onstein becoming very tall and also freakishly strong. This fight is incredible, what can I say? I'm just waffling, you all know how good this fight is, there's really not much I can say apart from that. After one of the best cutscenes in the entire game where a blind giant shoots down the black dragon, it's then up to you to vanquish the dragon that not even Anno Londo dare provoke. This fight is phenomenal, and if the Soul series has proved one thing, it's that it's very difficult to get a dragon fight done right. However, Calamite was the first good dragon fight, and still holds up to this day. He is a monster, he is incredibly resistant to all attacks, and can dish out an incredible amount of damage on his own, whether it's his beatdowns with his melee based attacks, or his black dragon fire which looks awesome even to this day. However, his most dangerous attack ironically doesn't do much damage, it is his calamity breath, or his calamity vision I should say, where you are bombarded with that high pitched sound and then you take double damage from all of his subsequent attacks until the effect wears off. Also, you can cut off his tail and get the obsidian greatsword, which it's not exactly the best weapon in the game, but it is still just one additional thing to this fantastic fight. Also, the music... need I say any more? If not even Knight Artorius could beat Manus, Father of the Abyss, then what chance do you have? That is the thought that goes through my head every time I go into this boss fight. If you take the frantic pace of the Four Kings and dial it up to 11, you get Manus. 
This, in my opinion, is the perfect boss in Dark Souls 1 because he is incredibly challenging without being bullshit. He is incredibly aggressive and you need to treat this guy with respect, especially his 5-hit combo as if you get hit once, you are at the mercy of the entire combo. The arena is also pretty good. Sure, it's in the abyss once again, so it's not exactly beautiful by any means, but it is still just incredibly cool that you are fighting this guy at the heart of the abyss. It's it's just such a cool thing. He is incredibly resistant to pretty much all forms of attack, so you can't even cheese him like you can with other fights. But what sets Manus apart is his black magic. He's got three different spells, one that is a barrage of black spells, another is a rain of spells, and then the third one which you saw there was where the spells cover the arena and then charge inwards which can knock you from behind. These magic spells do incredible amounts of damage and if you don't use the you know, the broken pendant found in Ula Seal, you are very, very vulnerable to them. Seriously, they are incredibly damaging. This fight is a rush from start to finish, and it is easily my favorite fight in the game, and one of my favorite bosses in the entire series. But anyways, guys, that was my ranking of the Dark Souls boss fights from worst to best. I hope you enjoyed. Feel free to let me know your rankings down below, and hit the subscribe button and like the video if you want me to make more of these in the future. Have a great rest of your day, guys, and I will see you all in the next one. Take care.